If you've ever seen a picture of Lady Justice or a statue of Lady Justice, you'll recall that she is a woman that is blindfolded, right? She holds the scales of justice in her hand, normally a sword in the other, and most images of her will include a blindfold. Well, there's a lot of power in that imagery because behind our ideal of justice is this. First off, the scales of justice to determine what is right and wrong and whether you're in the right or the wrong. So the scales are tipping your favor for or against you based on the evidence. Secondly, of course, the sword, which is a symbol of justice. It's a sword, uh, even in Romans, for example, talks about how civil authorities wield the sword on God's behalf. So just as we put people, uh, arrest people, or there's, there's certain forms of punishment given to different in individuals for crimes, that is an expression of wielding the sword, so to speak. So she's wielding a sword. She's got the scales of justice, but that third piece is critical. She's blindfolded. And that is a symbol of her impartiality, that she truly weighs a case with impartiality to determine whether somebody is innocent or guilty and impartially renders a verdict. Because we don't want to go before a court and they already have their minds made up on you, right? That's why we, in this country, we enjoy this. We enjoy the assumption that we're innocent until proven guilty. Because it would be a horrible thing to be guilty at the outset and the whole time you're trying to prove your innocence. It'd be even worse if the judge was somebody who was offended or the offended party. Or if you had a an entire 12 people on the, on the jury stand who were out for your blood, right? When that happens, we have a term for it. It's called a kangaroo court. And throughout societies, throughout civilizations, we don't even fully know where this phrase came from, but the idea is that there's a prejudice built into the system already so that even if you're going through the formal hearings, it's just all a farce. It's not legit. They already have the outcome determined, and now they're just going for you. And in this section of chapter 18, in all of the Gospels, really we are introduced into one of the craziest kangaroo court systems that the human race has ever been exposed to. We see Jesus put on trial. He has no legal defense, nobody there to defend him, and those who are after him already have their minds made up. And so it's, it's a very troubling scene, but it is exactly how Jesus ended up on the cross for our sins. And so it's a critical scene to see what God has done in Christ to save us from injustice and from our sins. So Jesus is dragged to court. He's dragged into kangaroo court. And on this secret of night, we're going to witness three things in this account. We're going to witness three different scenes in John chapter 18, the first thing that we witness on this secretive night of trial is a corrupt priest. So if you're taking notes, the first point is a corrupt priest. So at the end of chapter, excuse me, the end of verse 11, Jesus is arrested. He tells Peter to put the sword away to see that he's going to drink the cup that the Father has given him. The band of soldiers then grab him, bind him, and lead him first to a man named Annas. In verse 13, he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Again, verse 14, it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, to get a fuller picture of this, now let's look at verse 19 through 24. Verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Well, Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. At this kangaroo court, the secret of night, the first thing we witness is a corrupt priest. Now, I was tempted to put corrupt priests because you get a little lost in this section of John's gospel 
on who the priest is at first because we're told about Caiaphas, who is high priest, but then we're talked about Annas, who's high priest. And then we're like, well, which one is the high priest? Because he's in the high priest's house, and then he's passed from the high priest to the high priest. So let me first explain some ambiguity built into this passage so you understand what is happening. And by the way, John's gospel is the only gospel of our four that have this exchange between Annas leading into Caiaphas. So we don't know about Annas' interaction with Jesus apart from this. But Annas was the high priest appointed not by God's people, not by the church. He was appointed by Rome because they're under Roman captivity. So this is the highest authority in the church. This would be like the Pope, if you will, or whoever would be the very top of the org chart in the church's system at the time. So he was high priest, and in the Old Testament law, the high priest was appointed that position for life. Kind of like our Supreme Court, once you're in, you're not out. There's not a four-year term or anything. You're in until you die, all right? And so he is appointed as high priest, but then he is deposed as high priest by Rome. So he's put into power and removed by power by Valerius Gratus, Uh, who was Pilate's predecessor. You don't need to remember that, but here's the point. Here's a man that was put into power. Most of the church, most of God's people look to him and say, he's still the rightful leader. But Rome does not recognize him, and now Rome has passed things off to his son-in-law, who happens to be Caiaphas at the time. So Annas, in, in a sort, because five of his other sons also eventually become high priests, He's like the high priestly patriarch, if you will. All right, everybody's looking to this guy, and even though he's not the real leader, they still call him the high priest, almost like in our country where you have the president, and if you're not president anymore, you're still referred to as Mr. President, right? It's, a, it's an emeritus title. It's a title of honor. So, and in Judaism at this point, they're probably all looking to Annas anyway, even if he's not in charge saying, What does Annas say? Because we really think that he is the real high priest. So this is an incredibly powerful man. He may not be the official high priest, but everybody is looking to him. Everybody is keying off of him. What does Annas think? And what does Annas say? So it's not um, unthought of. It's not out of the... What's the word I'm looking for? It's not unusual. We shouldn't read this and be disturbed that they're bringing them to this guy who's not really the high priest. In fact, it appears that he and Caiaphas are sharing the same house so that he brings them to this man's house who is also the house of Caiaphas. So does that make sense? A little bit of what's going on here. Annas is the first one to receive Jesus. Then he's passed off. And by the way, if you've ever read the Gospels and got confused at the trial of Jesus, it's because there are so many handoffs. So he starts with Annas, this guy. He gets handed off to Caiaphas. Caiaphas is now assorting the Sanhedrin, which is the, the top leaders. It's like uh, it's the, the 71 men that are in charge of the church to make a decision on Jesus. So it's the highest court in the land. So this is probably what's happening. Annas is stalling with Jesus. Caiaphas is assembling a quorum, enough people to bring this together. He hands them off when the time is right. Then they hand them over to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate hands him off to Herod because he's from Herod's jurisdiction. Herod hands him back to Pontius Pilate. And this is all in one night into the next day before the crucifixion of Jesus. So if I've lost you at all, that's why you get sometimes confused as you read through the scriptures. If you harmonize them, that is the sequence of what's going on here as Jesus has passed from kangaroo court the kangaroo court from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. He's passed basically from Annas and Caiaphas which is Israel, the church. He's passed over to Rome, which is the civil authorities, that is the states. So he's passed from the church authorities over to the state authorities. So what do we see about this priest? We see, first off, that it's night. All right, that is a total taboo no-no in the court system, all right? You're not bringing people in secretly at night to question them with no defense, no defendant, He comes to him, and as we see from the other gospel accounts, then they start to pile up all these false witnesses. So he's completely unprepared. I mean, Jesus knew what was going to happen to him, but there's there's no defense, 
no defense for him provided false witnesses are piled up on Jesus and they're doing this at night. And by the way, in Judaism, there's a requirement if you want to execute somebody, it has to be delayed for at least two days. And so they're probably trying to get this just in time so they can pass him off to the civil authorities and feel like they did their due diligence. They have timed this perfectly to pile on Jesus and make sure that he is condemned and executed. And by the way, the whole Sanhedrin, which is gathered, that's the church authorities, the, the civil, or excuse me, the ecclesiastical, the Jewish authorities, there's an eerie consensus that's already built by, against Jesus, except for two people. Nicodemus appears in chapter 3, comes to him by night, and Joseph, who's the very man that provides the tomb for Jesus in the garden. Besides those two men, everybody cast their lot against Jesus. Before I move on to the next point, you'll notice in here, verse 14, it says it was Caiaphas. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it would be expedient, it would be necessary, it would be be faster if they just one person would die for the people. That comes out of John chapter 11, if you want to flip there really quick. This gives you a little bit of a curtain, pulls back the curtain on what that reference is to. It was a few months ago I preached this. So this is by way of reminder. Chapter 11 of John's gospel, just flip a few pages earlier in verse 45. I just want to reread this to you because it is breathtaking to see exactly the plot that was put together to lead to this point. John 11, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, this is after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the seventh of the great signs in John's gospel. Lazarus was raised from the dead. He had been dead for days. Jesus spoke and said, Lazarus, come out. He was raised from the dead. Many people are starting to believe in Jesus. So listen to this, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, referring to Mary and Martha, Lazarus' brother, And had seen what he, Jesus, did, believed in him. They believed in Jesus. But some of them, some of the people who did not believe in Jesus, went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. The Pharisees is a religious, powerful group within Judaism. So the chief priests, again, here are the priests, these top priests, and the Pharisees gathered the council, that's the Sanhedrin, that's the 71 that would uh, make the decision against Jesus and said, what are we going to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, remember son-in-law of Annas, who was high priest that year because he was appointed by Rome, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied unintentionally, but he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And I love this. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one. The children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him, Jesus, to death. There was a lot packed into verse Chapter 18, verse 14. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews to be expedient that one man should die for the people. But here's the point of the corruption we see here. Jesus standing before the Sanhedrin never had a chance. They had already met privately and decided the whole outcome. They were going after Jesus to put him to death. This was not a fair trial. It wasn't intended to be a fair trial. This was a kangaroo court. The verdict was decided before they ever even met with Jesus. So first, this secret of night, we witness a corrupt priest. Secondly, we witness a cowardly disciple. A cowardly disciple. This is verses 15 to 18 and 25 through 27. So follow along in the narrative where we pick up. Chapter 18, verse 15. Simon Peter, do you see that? Simon Peter followed Jesus. So Simon Peter just pushed pause for a minute. He had pulled out his sword. In verse 11, Jesus told him to put his sword away, sheathed them. All the disciples scattered. But Simon Peter actually follows, I'm sure, at a safe distance behind, as did another disciple who is unnamed. See that? So 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. 
Since that disciple was known to the high priest, the one unnamed disciple was known to the high priest, whether Annas or Caiaphas, we don't know, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So this disciple is known, he has access, but Peter is not, so he can't get in. But listen to this. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in with him. Well, the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, because it was night, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Now jump forward to verse 25. Now Simon Peter, you see that? Verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. We pick up the narrative there. So they said to him, a group of them are now speaking, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. Peter cut off Malchus's ear. Jesus healed it. This is a relative of Malchus. This man, one of these servants, a relative of Malchus said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once, a rooster crowed. This secretive night we witness a cowardly disciple. Jesus had prophesied that this would happen with Peter. If you want to see where that was, chapter 13, Jesus promises or tells Peter. This is chapter 13, verse 36. You don't have to flip there. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Just as Jesus had predicted, Peter, who thought that he would be brave and defend Jesus, now denies Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. Again, we don't know who this unnamed disciple is. A lot of people believe it was John who wrote the gospel, but that is speculative. But here's the idea. Peter is a nobody in light of the high court or the high priest. He's not known. He's not going to get into the courtyard, all right? They're not just letting anybody walk on the White House lawn, all right? You just can't stroll on in and peer in the door, you know, or look through the window. But whoever, whether it was John or one of these other secret one of these disciples of Jesus clearly has some serious street cred, all right? He is known, and he has access. He can, he can talk to the girl at the front door, get himself in, say, oh, Peter was left out. Turn around, go talk to her again. He's with me. That kind of cred and get Peter into the courtyard of the high priest. And Peter is watching this from a distance, and we can tell from Luke's gospel that Peter can actually see Jesus wherever he is in this courtyard, And Jesus can actually see Peter, which is a crazy thought that this exchange, Peter is watching for at least an hour, probably two, because in Luke's gospel, it looks really close here, the second and the third denial, but actually in Luke's Luke's gospel, we are told that an hour, about an hour has passed between those two denials. So at least an hour or two, Peter is there, he's standing by a fire, he's warming himself, the first interrogation of a servant girl. Wait a minute. You're not with him, are you? You're not with Jesus. Nah, I'm not. Ooh, did I really just say that? I was the one that said, I just pulled my sword out. I mean, the relative of the guy I cut the ear off is here, like in this circle. No, I don't. I'm, nope, no, I don't, don't know who you're talking about. I'm just friends with this other guy. I don't know Jesus. You're not one of his followers. No, no. And John does a masterful work in his literary devices here. It's pretty powerful if you think about it. I'm pulling these stories together. But think about what John has just done here. He's showing us Jesus speaking to Annas. Then he pushes pause. Then he takes us to a fire to go over and look at Peter and see what Peter's doing. 
And he pushes pause and he goes back to show us with Jesus and Annas, Jesus being struck so forth. Then he pushes pause again and goes back. This is like a movie almost, right? Where you're, you can push pause and get an omniscient scene into another room. Because obviously the resurrected Christ, I'm sure, told John and us that what, what happened, those exchanges. But John is intentionally going back and forth to show us these different scenes and to show us the cowardice of Peter in the midst of this scene. Peter, who not once, not twice, but three times denies Jesus while he can still see Jesus out of the peripheral of his eye. And we are told this in Luke's gospel, that after Jesus, excuse me, after Peter denies Jesus the third time, and the rooster who was prophesied crows, Jesus looks directly to Peter. Could you imagine throwing Jesus completely under the bus, denying him, distancing yourself from him. And in the moment, right as the rooster is crowing, Jesus is in conversation, being smacked, being beaten up, being bound. Rooster crows. Right on time. Jesus knows Peter's heart perfectly. And he knows our heart perfectly as well. In that moment, John's gospel doesn't record this, but Luke again tells us that Peter wept bitterly. I would think so. I would think so. Those eyes of the Lord gazing at you as you deny him. And yet I think the pastoral point under this point is that if we're honest with ourselves, there's a little bit of a Peter in each one of us. That we're gauging who we're around whether we will acknowledge Christ. We might not flat out deny him, but we might not bring him up, right? You know what I'm saying? If Jesus is the most important thing to you, and he is if you're a follower of Christ, I mean, he's the savior of the world, but he has saved your soul. He lives inside of you. And we can walk around and judge who we're around. You don't, you know, the banter around the fire is not a place to bring up Jesus, and we just remain eerily quiet or things turn to Jesus, and we don't defend him. The other day, I was getting my hair cut, and I was actually proud of the barber. There was this guy that was JC this, and JC that, and JC, 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 and I'm like the pastor in the chair next door, like, no one knows I'm a pastor, but I'm just thinking, like, I don't want to be self-righteous here, but I, I mean, this is getting uncomfortable, you know, and the barber just said, whoa, just cool it down with the JC, all right? I was just like, high five for my barber, you know? But the point is, what do we do when Jesus is before us? Do we identify with him, even if it makes us unpopular, even if it puts our life on the line? For our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, in the Muslim world, this is not even theoretical if you can lose your life. You might lose your life if you identify with Jesus. Peter is in here in this moment of decision, but this is a decision all of us have to make when we're around the fire at night. Will we stand up for Jesus? Will we identify with Jesus? Or will we deny Jesus either explicitly or just through our deafening silence? Jesus knows our heart. And the thing that's glorious about this passage and the larger teaching of Peter's story is that though Peter is an utter failure in this moment, And though we may be in utter failure in some of our moments, Jesus isn't done with Peter. And Jesus isn't done with you. That when we are a coward, God comes to us through the Holy Spirit to give us courage and boldness and give us another shot. I have a whole other message at the end of the book that I won't preach now where Peter is restored. So I'm going to save that for later. But God is not done with Peter and he is not done with us. In the midst of a corrupt priest and a cowardly disciple, God is up to something bigger than we can, any of us can imagine. So we encounter first the corrupt priest, secondly the cowardly disciple, and in the secret of night, thirdly and finally, we encounter a courageous Savior. We encounter a courageous Savior We've already seen the exchange between Jesus and Annas. This is verse 19. 
through 24, so I won't read it fully again. But you see here where Annas is questioning him. Notice this, he's questioning him about his disciples, verse 19, and his teaching, right? He's questioning about his disciples and his teaching. Do you notice what Jesus doesn't talk about at all? Doesn't bring up his disciples once. Once again, Jesus is protecting them. He changes the subject completely to himself. Verse 20, I've spoken openly to the world. My teaching, what I've taught in the synagogues, the temples, wherever all the Jews come together, I've said nothing in secret. Once again, quite a contrast, both between what they are doing, he's teaching in the day in the public, they're pulling him together at night, alone, in secret, but also it's quite a contrast between Peter and Jesus. As we see these scenes toggle back and forth, because again, earlier in the garden, they come to him, we say, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus says over and over, I am he, I am he. They go to Peter, they say, are you with him? I am not. Do you see it? The courage of Jesus in the midst of the cowardice of his disciples. I am he. He takes responsibility for his teaching. He doesn't say anything's wrong with it because nothing is wrong with it. It's 100% true. It was true then, it's true today. Everything that Jesus has spoken is perfect from God for you and for me. And the goal of verse 22, where one of the officers standing by strikes Jesus with his hand. Is this how you ought to answer the high priest? The self-control of God in that moment. Think about that. There would be no high priest apart from Jesus. God himself incarnate in the room and the great high priest that will now abolish the high priestly office and become the eternal high priest over God's people now and forever. According to Hebrews, the reason we don't have high priests, the reason we don't have sacrifices is because the one that was just smacked in the face is about to abolish the high priestly system and forever rule and reign as both sacrifice and priest forever over God's people. And in that moment, he has smacked for dishonoring the high priest when he didn't. And in that moment, Jesus uses all restraints if they only knew who they were smacking. Is this how you speak to the Son of God? Would have been a rightful response. But Jesus opened not his mouth. Lady Justice is blind, a blindfold over her eyes. That day, there was no blindfold on anybody except for one. They put the blindfold on Jesus. They bound him, they blindfolded him, they beat him, they said, prophesy, who is it that struck you? Justice was turned upside down. And yet, the courage of Jesus to be beaten and flogged, the courage of Jesus to have a crown of thorns pressed upon his brow. Before he's even pronounced guilty, these things were happening to Jesus. Though Jesus experienced their injustice, as Caiaphas prophesied, Jesus was dying for the sins of the nation. And not only for them, he was dying for us, for all those of God's people all over the world, every nation, every tribe, every tongue that he would bring in so that God's justice would be rectified, that the, all the injustices of the world would be undone, all the evil of the world would be paid for. Jesus took the blindfold and placed it on himself and suffered under this corrupt courts, his courage, his love for you and for me so that we would experience the gift of forgiveness, everlasting life, and his love now. And on that final day of justice, a judge who says not guilty for you and for me because Jesus took your guilt on himself.